So welcome everyone to today's session of the Financial History Webinar Series. Today, I am very pleased to host Javier Mejia, who will be presenting his paper, Modernizing Elites in Latin America, Social Network Evidence from the Emergence of Banking in Antioquia. Um, Javier Mejia is a postdoctoral scholar at Stanford University. He has been a lecturer and a postdoctoral associate in economics at New York University, Abu Dhabi, and a visiting scholar at the University of Bordeaux. He received his PhD in economics from Los Andes University. So how the session will work is that Javier will have around 30 minutes or so to present his paper, followed by a Q&A session. We kindly ask you to not interrupt the presentation and leave your questions for, for the Q&A session. And uh, of course, you can text us in the, in the chat at any point in time, and you can share your questions through the chat um, or just raise your hands using the reaction buttons. And we'll, I let you open the, your microphone and, and your camera so you can ask the, the questions after the end of the, of the session. Also, it's important to remember that this session is being recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. We will send you the, the links in the, in the chat later on. So welcome everyone once again, especially Javier. It's a pleasure to have you here and the floor is all yours. Great, thank you, Sergio, um, and thank you um, all for coming. Um, I'm very happy to be here. I need to um, say that I'm pretty jet lagged. I had things to do in Abu Dhabi. I arrived yesterday from California, so like half of my brain is not functioning at the moment. But hopefully, the half that is working um, does a good job. But just have some patience if um, if I'm a bit sluggish. So. Um, I'm very happy to present this, um, this paper. So this is uh, a sort of spin-off of a larger project in which I've been working for about a decade now, <clears throat> in which I tried to understand how social networks um, played an important role in, in, in the emergence of, uh, of a modern economy and industrial entrepreneurship in particular. But, um, but so what I tried to do in this paper is considering that well, the data had been collected and, um, um, and it was possible with, um, with that data to, to understand how elites have evolved, right? So basically the purpose of the paper is to have a better understanding of this <clears throat> um, important animal in the history of Latin America, the elites that um, are fre frequently described as uh, fundamental uh, in, the, in the evolution of, of, of the history of the region, but uh, in my perception, not uh, fully uh, understood well. And I'm going to go into details of, of, of why is that in, in a second. But, um, but that's the origin of the paper. It's supposed to be part of, um, of a volume edited by Felipe Valencia on the um, new economic history of of Latin America that uh, tries to gather some of the most recent research in, in, in the field. And well, I'm very excited about that. But so let me start motivating the issue. And let me see, okay, yeah. By sort of describing the large question that um, inspired the, this paper, right? And uh, the origin of it comes from a sort of paradox in and the study of elites in general, right? Um, and the paradox consists on the fact that frequently, and this is a common perception, not only in the public opinion, but many intellectual traditions embrace this type of idea that elites are this sort of cohesive community, right? And elites are frequently described as these sort of monolithic entities that have common interests and that shape and control the world like more or less with their fingers. And more specifically in economic history, when you think about the emergence of uh, modern capitalism, it is frequently described how this resulted from the um, efforts of this fairly cohesive class of 
you could call that the bourgeoisie or the large capital um, that had uh, common interest and that, well, ended up shaping the system into what we know nowadays as, 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 as modern capitalism, right? And uh, although there's clearly a lot of evidence and of, of, the, of this process, it is also clear when you look at um, entrepreneurial history that um, when you look at specific individuals within these elites, uh, you recognize how in their daily activities, what they're doing is actually competing with others, uh, all the members of these elites, right? And here you have this like aggregate process of uh, creative destruction, which uh, at least at an individual level, you're basically trying to destroy these other fellows of the same community. Uh, in order actually to survive and, and, and keep your privileges or uh, gain additional uh, advantages, right? So the paradox consists basically in how you can reconcile this um, individualistic competitive behavior with this aggregate um, uh, sort of cohesive or well-synchronized behavior of, uh, of elites as a social class. What I try to do in this paper is try to think about that issue, thinking about the elites as agglomerations of individuals, right? So I move away from thinking in the, um, elites as this broad notion of a social class, and I try to get evidence from individual level um, and uh, describe how these individuals interacted and how you can have aggregate patterns at a, a community level, right? And um, I try to do that with a very specific uh, context, uh, which is gonna be the modernization, the modernization of Antioquia. I'm gonna tell you more about the, the empirical context in a bit. Um, but in this context, I'm going to focus on bankers, which are gonna be this component of the elite that is gonna bridge the traditional economy with the modern economy. And I'm going to focus on these bankers, and I'm going to explore how they interacted among themselves and with uh, other members of the elite. And hopefully this will give us some good understanding of, of, of the community based on the individual behavior, right? Um, I'm gonna tell you that the data that I'm gonna use is magnificent, uh, and hopefully you are going to agree with that. And um, it's gonna be, again, individual level data that is going to uh, take place in a network setting. So I'm basically gonna have uh, social networks of this community, of the elite of this region over the 19th and 20th century. And I'm gonna see this network evolving. I'm gonna have outcomes at, um, at, uh, business, uh, at business level, right? And the way in which I'm going to analyze that data is using conventional econometrics in, in a network setting. I need to say that this specific paper as um, it's intended to be part of this, um, this book that is directed to a large audience is not um, particularly, I don't wanna say rigorous, but like it's strict with uh, the econometrics behind uh, it. So if you are, Pretty interested in identification issues. Probably you're not be fully satisfied with what I'm going to show you here, but that is not really the purpose of this paper. This paper is rather intended to be uh, descriptive and thought-provoking and uh, suggestive of of uh, potential uh, explanations rather than uh, uh, sort of like a stringent um, causal uh, inference type of paper. So I need to anticipate that. Um, to begin with, right? I have other, like this agenda that I work on has other papers that um, uh, hopefully would be more convincing in, in, in that sense, but not this, okay? So let me start describing you the context and, and the data, and hopefully this would uh, motivate even more the, the, this exercise. So the first thing is that I'm going to be studying Antioquia. This is this region in um, the central part of, uh, of Colombia. That means this region in the northern part of South America, up there in the, at Los Andes, a very isolated place. Um, for uh, centuries, it was disconnected, not only from the coast and therefore from 
uh, the rest of the world, but also from the rest of, of Colombia, right? Um, the largest city in this region is Medellin, probably you visited Medellin, have you heard of it? Nowadays is the second largest city uh, in Colombia and back then, and back then I mean in the mid 19th century when uh, modernization begins, <clears throat> it was a fairly uh, medium sized um, um, village, if you want, I'm gonna show you a picture in a bit. So this is the region that I'm gonna be studying. There are several reasons why this region is particularly interesting. Albert Hirschman would say when uh, trying to understand how and why Latin America was as it was, <clears throat> he had in mind three particular cases of, of modernization. And one of those was Antioquia, the other two were um, um, Monterrey, Nuevo Leon as a larger region and Sao Paulo. Regions that modernize um, outside the traditional, like political, um, <clears throat> um, let's say, the uh, chain of, of, of power, and had the traditional attributes of the Latin American modernity, right? So, a good part of the conventional elements of industrialization, but all at the same time, the high inequality and the high presence of informal activities and, and the influence of, uh, of family related issues. And Antioquia is one of these. If you compare Antioquia with this other, uh, and not just with uh, Nuevo Leon and Sao Paulo, but the rest of the uh, industrial poles of the region, you have also some specificities that I think make it convenient for this type of exercise and probably even a bit more interesting than the rest. And probably the most important of those is that the industrialization of the region happened as a rather isolated and home-driven process, right? So it was basically the elite, a very isolated elite um, that led the industrialization process, right? So I can actually show you this very fast. Uh, when you compare the, and when you look at the owners of the industrial companies uh, in the early stages of the industrialization uh, process in, in the Americas, uh, in most places uh, of the continent, what you have is a very important role of immigrants, right? However, in Antioquia, that was not the case. Only 5% of, of the owners of these new industries were immigrants, right? Uh, the rest of them were locals, basically members of these elite that, as I was telling you, was very small and very isolated. And that's great for uh, several reasons and probably the most important one is that that makes it feasible, this aim of reconstructing a complete network. I don't know how many of you are familiar with network settings, but there's this hypothesis of the um, small world or the five degrees of separation, which basically suggests that very rapidly you can be connected in the real world with anyone else, right? So we are more or less five degrees away from Bill Gates or from Lady Gaga or whatever, right? So that's five steps. It's like, it's like very close, right? And the practical implication of that is that if you intend to construct the full network of a given community, eventually you would have the bridges that connect that community with the rest of the world. And therefore what you would have is to connect the entire world and have a network of the entire world, which is not a feasible uh, task uh, for at least for the current technology that we have. But if there is, but if it's reasonable for a given setting, is this setting, right? A very endogenous community quite isolated from the rest of the country and the rest of the world. And the interesting thing again is that this community was the one that led the modernization of the region. So more or less in the uh, second part, the beginning of the second part of the 19th century, this uh, elite decided to start creating this industrial and modern sector, this industrial and modern um, firms that would eventually become an entire sector and would trigger the industrialization of the region. So that's something that is particular about Antioquia and makes it super interesting and makes it functional for the type of effort of thinking about networks and elites in, in, in a practical way. There's another argument that I think makes it <clears throat> interesting to study Antioquia, although it's a region that many of you probably are not interested in um, uh, in the first place. And this is a sort of external validity type of argument, which is that most of the uh, features that um, you perceive in um, 
less developed regions currently in the world share the features of Antioquia before the industrialization, right? So things like a very difficult geography, market failures all over the place, a weak state capacity, low living conditions, elements that are uh, prevalent in development economics, and this could be in rural India or rural Afghanistan, are things that were prevalent as well in Antioquia before the, the industrialization. So I can show you a picture. This is Medellin just before the, the modernization. It is a lovely small town that uh, does not resemble at all what it is today, which is a fairly large uh, city, right? So what I'm trying to say with that in here, just provide some um, like hard data on, on that. And uh, I wanna see if I can get back here, yep. Um, what I want to say with that is that you can learn something from this episode, even if you're interested in uh, current issues uh, regarding modernization and development, right? So what do I do? I think about the modernization of this region and I collected data on the elite, right? So I collected information on something like a hundred, a um, uh, thousand, nine hundred individuals uh, from the late 18th century until the, the early 20th century, and I collect information on their connections, right? I'm gonna tell you in a bit how that happens. In addition, I bring data of all the banks created during this period. Let me tell you about this here. I'm sorry, there's a typo that should say uh, banking firms. So we're talking about banks here. And that information comes from founding charters, secondary sources, but basically I have information on, on, on all the banks created in the region, um, until the Great Depression, I have information on how they operated, in which period, where exactly they were located, the amount that of capital that was used to create the banks, the identity of the partners and the board of directors, and, um, and I call this the resilience of, of, of the bank, right? So we're going to know like how successful were these banks in, in a broad perspective. So that's regarding the banks, right? Probably the most interesting part of the data is that that is the relational data, so the network data. And that data comes from an exhaustive uh, research on, on primary and, and, and secondary sources, but I spent years um, of my beautiful youth doing this in the archive. So I visited more than 15 archives, this implied uh, uh, explored more than 100 primary sources, and I constructed the data on the network following the two classical uh, approach in sociology to reconstruct social networks. So one is a descending sampling approach. This is the type of methods that you would use and you would find in the peer effects literature. And basically it consists of identifying key dimensions of interactions and basically defining criteria for knowing if people are connected to. So for instance, I would look at um, schools of, of the elite and I would see the students and those that were part of the same school and the same of the same cohort, I would assume that they're connected uh, among themselves, right? Um, that's great, that has many problems. One of the problems is that it only captures information of, so, of uh, public spheres of interactions. So for instance, following that approach, you get just a handful of women because of their role at the moment in public spheres of interactions. However, you would clearly have a bias sample if you do not include a larger fraction of women, right? Because they were important in private spheres of interactions and they were fundamental connecting the network, right? So I follow a complementary approach, which is an ascending sampling that's fundamentally as noble sample sampling approach. Uh, and the way in which I do that is that I identify um, a couple of highly uh, visible figures that you would expect to be very well connected. And you would look at the connections that they have, and you would look at the connection that those connections had, and in that way you grow the sample. That approach is great in many ways. It captures this um, private spheres of interactions that I was describing, so family connections, friendship, um, are possible to gather through this approach. And it's also great because it allows me to identify individual by individual. And in that way, I can construct uh, the attributes of each of these individuals and that would be functional in the econometric specification. But 
this is probably very abstract at the moment. You might need uh, some uh, like very specific examples to understand how the data is constructed. And I realize I'm, I'm starting to run out of time. But to give you an idea, some of the sources that I use were the genealogies of the period. So in the Hispanic tradition, there's this uh, long interest for uh, lineages. So there's people that have spent their lives writing these compilations of lineages <clears throat> for this region. And this is how one of them looks like, right? So this is the um, the entrance of the first Mejia that arrived to the region, right? So what you have is the full name of, of the guy, you have some biographical information, you have the full name of his wife, you have the list of his, um, of his children, and there you have some ID to identify in the same source those individuals and, and, and recreate the same type of information. I look at all the genealogies of, uh, of that region, those genealogies, unfortunately, have a bunch of biases, the why exactly certain lineages show up and some others do not. It's hard to tell, so I complemented that with baptism records. It's, there are many great features about this setting. Pretty much everyone is Catholic, and in the Catholic tradition, it's really important that you're baptized, otherwise it's very likely that you get sick and you die. That's what my mom would say. But in any case, this is almost a census, right? Pretty much everyone is here. And what you have is this type of information, the name of the baby, and describes that he's the son of uh, this person, this other person. Something that is fantastic also about this Hispanic setting is that uh, we have two surnames, right? So our first surname is the first surname of our father, and our second surname is the first surname of our mother. And this is very helpful to reconstruct the, the lineages in a very precise way. Um, I also gather information on the business activities. So this comes from uh, mostly from constitution documents of firms. And what you have are this type of things. So these are, uh, you have the shareholders, you have the name of uh, the capital and what the activity of the firm was. Um, I also systematize information on, uh, on narratives that describe all their more subtle type of interactions. So people would describe that this person and this other person were friends and they happened to make business of this type in this moment in time. And I code all that information of a qualitative nature. And with that, I extract information on social interaction. One of the biggest challenge here is to do the matching between, um, between uh, sources that's extremely complicated at that moment. I did that uh, manually. Like today in my research, I use uh, machine learning and, and artificial intelligence, but I was very happy to have done this manually because, well, it gave me a good sense of what the challenges are. And just to give you an idea, for instance, when you're born in the baptism record, you show up as uh, Juan de la Cruz, Maria Uribe, right? And but then you grow up and you just sign the documents of the firms that you create as Juan Uribe, right? And the problem is that three of your brothers are also Juan. One is Juan Jose, the other one is Juan Daniel, whatever. And then it's hard to know which is which uh, in this setting. And that's 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 a whole mess. One of the ways in which I solved that out was going to the uh, cemetery of, of the elite. The great thing is that when you pass the way you're buried and they record again all the information about your names and, and, and your life, and frequently you are buried with your family. So this gives you additional information that allows you to disentangle some of, of the, confuse, and the confusion and, and allows you to improve the matching. Uh, right? So the way in which I, I construct the network is that I define specific criteria of interaction that describe that they were connected, right? So I have seven dimensions of interaction. I have a family network, a political network, and a few other uh, networks. And uh, each one describes a different dimension of interaction. So the family network is basically composed by people and they're connected who are part of the same family. And that means being connected if you're a parent, a couple, or the children or sibling of someone, right? Being, a poli being part of the political network means that you were a public servant and you were part of the same cabinet uh, of with these other people, right? So at the end, what I end up having are different networks. So this is the family network. Each dot is an individual. Each uh, edge is a connection. Again, if they're father, uh, uh, husband, wife, or, or children, or sibling. Um, and you have another network. This is intellectual network, for instance, right? You have different nodes 
and you have different edges because the, the interactions are different. What I do is that I collapse all that into one big network in which I weight by numbers of number of interactions. And uh, the interesting thing is that this network evolves in time. So I have this for every decade. I'm not going to show you um, a snapshot, uh, a screenshot of this every, every decade, uh, but every 25 years. But this is evolving every decade, right? So you can see how the, the network starts to uh, densify it as the uh, snowball grows. And eventually people start to disappear as I stop including people and people start to die. And what I do is that I get rid of the tails of the distribution and I focus on what I call the core period, which is the period for which I have information on banks, right? So let me tell you a few things about banks and I realize that I spend a lot of time describing the, um, the data, but uh, I love the data. I spend years collecting the data. So I guess that a few minutes of, of time doing uh, describing it is not that bad after all. Let me tell you a bit <clears throat> of the basic things that you need to know about the emergence of the banking system here. The first banks emerged in the late um, uh, 19th century. Most of them happened to be small regional banks. They, in the early days, you have a free banking uh, system in which banks could um, issue money. <clears throat> that system lasted for a few decades, eventually a central a uh, centralist type of government took power in Bogota, in Bogota and they uh, basically centralized the system and tried to exploit um, the advantages of, uh, of controlling the monetary policy and that affected the, the banking activity in, in, the, in the different regions, including Antioquia. Um, and the system never fully recovered. There was at some point a banking boom in the change of, of, of centuries. A good part of that was driven by speculation and the um, high uh, uh, volatility of the exchange rate that provided a bunch of opportunities uh, to banks. They didn't last much. You can see here this massive crisis that follow up the, the boom of that period. And then you have a, a period of what you would call an investment um, banking approach in which banks started to invest in the real sector. And I'm going to tell you how that's important in our broad. So the structure of most of these banks um, was uh, um, fairly standard. There were basically two types, two types of banks. You had family banks, which were mostly um, uh, owned by a given family and a handful of small shareholders. Small shareholders frequently provided work uh, or small amounts of capital. But you also have here the emergence of the first uh, corporations in the region, right? So while uh, the Restrepo and Cia and the Vicente Villahijos were a uh, uh, family business in which Vicente and his family were part of, of it, uh, some of these banks had hundreds of, uh, of shareholders. And there this opens the question of how you can have the control over these figures that uh, are the sort of uh, anonymized uh, entities uh, and how elites can uh, keep a grasp over them, right? Uh, probably this is not surprising for many, but um, here there's a very concrete um, a tool, which is the, the role of commercial houses. Commercial houses were the classic figure of, um, of organizing family businesses. So uh, most families had their commercial house and they performed different businesses under that figure. So what many of them did was basically own a large extent of stocks in many of these banks. And through that process, they control the system in a larger perspective, um, allocating resources into their, the areas of, of interest, right? I'm gonna show you more of that in a bit. <clears throat> so if you start thinking about bankers as uh, pieces of the elite, probably the first thing that you wanna do <clears throat> is to think about how they differ from other uh, pieces of, of this community, right? So if you think about the average banker uh, and how different it was from other members of the elite, um, the first thing that you recognize is that it seems to be a more traditional type of elite. So if you compare it with industrialists, for instance, what it seems to be is that um, they were less educated um, they uh, had larger um, uh, wealth before the modernization, so they came from wealthier families. 
they had a lower probability of living abroad. Things that were just the opposite with industrialists, right? Industrialists seems to have been this part of the elite that were more exposed to the, uh, the rest of the world, to modern ideas, to access to uh, knowledge uh, related to engineering, and less to this tradition of like old money if you want, right? So that already describes how these bankers were different from other pieces of the community, right? But what about when you look within the community of bankers, the first thing that you realize is that there was a lot of heterogeneity. I could look at this in like many different levels, but something that is quite salient about some of the most basic things is how the distribution of capital work here. So the median banker had investments of about uh, 800 uh, pesos, and that's something like uh, 20 times the GDP per capita. So just to give you an idea, these are not just like small amounts, these are fairly large amounts, but that's nothing compared with uh, the uh, resources that had invested some other, like the top 10% had like 9,000 uh, pesos and the 1% for uh, 40,000 pesos, right? So if you look at more detail into this distribution, you also recognize that what it seems to be happening behind this is not only that there's some people that had more money and of course they could invest more, but they had more active roles in the management of, this, um, of these companies, right? So most of these bankers were just people putting their capital to rent, but a handful of them, and those I would call them rentiers, but a handful of them were actual entrepreneurs, right? And they were part of the board of directors and they were making decisions, right? And there are ways to show that the amount invested and, 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 and the seed in, in the boards are correlated. So people would, that had invested more money were more likely to be part of, uh, of the board. And when you start to bridge this again with how other members of the elite and the intersection between bankers and other members of the elite uh, was important, you recognize that industrialists, for instance, were more likely to be these banking entrepreneurs, right? So those that were bankers and were also industrialists invested much more money. So we're talking about twice as much as those that were non-industrialists. And also they were fairly more likely to be part of the board of, of directors, right? So you're already like identifying that some pieces of these sub-communities were uh, overlap and uh, they had very specific type of behavior that differ from other parts of, of these communities, right? And a very specific way to describe this is, for instance, showing you this example of, uh, of the Vasquez Correa. The Vasquez Correa was this community, was this uh, two set of families fairly inter interconnected uh, among themselves that created one, two banks, basically. One was Vasquez Correa and CIA, but also they created Banco de Sucre. And through those banks, they channel resources to the creation of a whole range of, of businesses, a good part of them in industrial activities, right? And it's quite clear how the purpose of those banks was fundamentally that, right? Accessing uh, funding to, uh, to other type of activities, right? And that's gonna be eventually an additional piece that is going to fit into the puzzle of how these communities evolve towards one specific type of um, so I'm going to start like wrapping up, but before doing that, I want to describe how the position uh, in the network that these individuals had mattered, and in a very specific way. So when you think about the um, those that were bankers and how they were bankers, you see that what seemed to matter in terms of the, posi the position of the network was quite clear. What mattered was the number of connections that they had. All the other things that you can imagine from a structural perspective, how influential were their connections or how influential the connections or the connections were, those things didn't matter. What mattered was that you had many connections, those that had more connections controlling for other observables. Not only were more likely to be bankers, they invested in more banks and they put more money in those uh, banks, right? Um, there are ways to show that it's, this is not a reverse causality story. And I do that by exploding the temporal um, uh, dimension of, of the data. But the important thing here is to realize how it seems that connections were doors to access to uh, investment opportunities, right? So you had to know people to be accepted into these projects of 
um, of being a banker, right? Of being a shareholder of those bankers, of, of those banks. And I would like to compare this, and I'm gonna do this very quickly with some of the findings that I have on some of my other papers on, on, on industrial entrepreneurship, because in industrial entrepreneurship, what seems to be quite clear is that what matters is not to be, to have many friends, to have many connections or to be well connected at a local level, but what matters is to be connected at a global level. What is important in order to be an industrial entrepreneur is to be able to connect the bankers with the politicians, with the engineers, with the miners. That's what matters. And I showed this uh, 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 chart from one of my papers in which I explored the ex exogenous variation that comes from the unexpected death of members of the elite and how that shocks the network and could uh, allow you to show that those that have an increase in global connectivity, that's the red uh, bar, are the ones that are end up becoming, uh, creating more, end up creating more industrial firms, right? So again, what seems to be is that more connections provide you with more opportunities to invest money. Now, what's the value of that? Are you making more money because you have more friends and you have access to better opportunities? Well, that doesn't seem to be the case. Um, what actually seems to be the case is that what matters is who you were connected with, right? So people would give you the opportunities to invest and you would invest more money, but that's not going to affect the profits of your portfolio. What is going to affect the profits of your portfolio is how uh, far away you are from certain individuals. So the basic takeaway here, and this is a coefficient plot, so this is basically the, 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 the value and the significance of each attribute in, in, in a regression where you have all the possible controls. So if you're a politician, you're less, uh, you're basically investing in banks that do worse. So here I think that the outcome variable is that uh, one of your banks does not uh, survive a, a crisis or how many of the, those crises survive. And the other one is um, that your bank goes bankrupt. Right, I think it's, I don't remember which is which uh, at the moment, but again, the main takeaway here is that if you're a politician or you're closer, so it's for you, it's cheaper to get access to a politician, you're gonna do worse, your banking portfolio is gonna do worse, while being an industrialist or being closer to an industrialist, it's gonna be good for your portfolio, right? I can only speculate on what are the reasons for that. What seems to be the most reasonable explanation is that industry, as I described with this Basques and, and Compania uh, story, were a great hedge um, in terms of, uh, of where to put your money. Uh, and being or influenced by politicians was not great in the sense that would push you into more uh, volatile and um, activities that are more sent that were more sensitive to the political cycle. Let me just uh, bring one more issue very rapidly about how these communities eventually evolve and sort of um, uh, connected eventually. And then I would close with some general remarks and I'll be very happy to discuss the, the, this more extensively. And again, I'm sorry that I took much more than uh, time than what I was expecting, but um, an important narrative here related to the long-term uh, effects of these forces where, and I don't know if this is surprising for you, but it's um, a very coherent from a theoretical perspective is that these communities eventually ended up amalgamating, right? A way to see this is to compare this to individuals. This is data from their uh, inheritance records. So Julian Vasquez was this banker, most of the money that, uh, 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 that he had at the time of that was uh, personal loans and the rest of it was mostly in, uh, traditional sectors like real estate, mostly in rural areas and um, stocks of these uh, early banks. And when you look at his granddaughter, Vicente Bevilla, uh, most of his assets when he died in the, uh, in the 20s were in industry, right? Uh, although he still had some role in, in banking, right? And you can see how this uh, families and you describe how the connections of, uh, of, of of them evolve, push the whole elite into that direction. So this banking elite eventually became this industrialism and that makes a lot of sense. So basically what I'm telling you is that if you were connected or you, you were closer to the industrialists, you were gonna do better as a banker, right? 
So naturally, you either would like to do that and finding opportunities for doing that. And I described this with qualitative data about how you started to make business with the early industrialists and how you started in the long term to marry your daughters, your uh, sons with uh, these families. And in that way, you have the social forces that would eventually connect these communities. And again, we're inferring this from individual behavior. So I want to close uh, just wrapping up a bit the, the story here. The first thing is that you have these bankers that are clearly a diverse community. The average banker was this sort of traditional lead, but as I described, eventually they would amalgamate with this industrialist. And the reasons behind that are fairly logical, right? Bankers needed new business opportunities. Industrialists provided that. And industrialists needed funding and needed the prestige that came from this all the leads, right? And the mechanisms behind there are quite interesting. You have both social mechanisms described as this uh, non-economic type of connections that emerge like friendship, marriages, and so on. But you also have explicit economic mechanisms, right? I told you how commercial houses were actual tools in order to control these large banks to uh, get involved in specific activities that were profitable in the short term, right? Your position in the network matters. It's not just that you wanted to be part of these large communities, but the more connections that you had, you had best investment opportunities that didn't impact the performance of your portfolio, but your proximity to certain communities did impact that portfolio. And that eventually, it's very likely that had shaped the structure of this elite. I think this brings up uh, um, some important ideas into how to uh, think about the persistence of elites, which again is a common uh, sort of even leitmotif in the history of Latin America. We describe the region as this region controlled by these families. But in most cases, they tell you about these colonial families that have political power and uh, basically maintain the status quo. But what I'm telling you here is that when you look at a granular level, the data at least of this region, what you have is not exactly that. You have a rather fluid community that is trying to adapt to changing times and is trying to embrace different types of mechanisms to survive and, and, and coexist with, uh, with new forces. And hopefully this uh, would encourage uh, uh, new research that uses individual level data that thinks about elites interacting between local and national levels and that things more systematically about social mechanisms. So when people think about family, what exactly means a family and what exactly is doing a family concentrating power and wealth, right? It's not just the unit of analysis. It's a very specific type of tool that is conditioned by many things that provides a bunch of economic opportunities that needs to be better understood. So again, I'm sorry that it took much longer than what I expected, but I'm very happy and, and willing to uh, hear your uh, comments and, and questions. Thank you very much, uh, Javier, for your presentation and for what's a very, very interesting paper exploring new, new regions and using quite novel methodologies um, to understand these, these issues. We have uh, around 10 minutes, a bit longer, to have a, a discussion and questions. If anyone wants to ask um, any questions, please use your, the raise button or let us know in, in the chat. And I might open the discussion with, with a couple of questions while uh, people ask us their, their own questions. So you do have in, in, in your paper um, uh, a deeper discussion about the, the methods you used um, to understand uh, the difference between the industrialists and, um, and the bankers. Uh, and we'll use standard econometric regressions for these. And what you show us today is the, the network analysis. I was wondering in terms of the, of the methodology, to what extent can you start as the arguing causation rather than, than correlation using these alternative uh, methods of network analysis, particularly in the sense that although you divide both groups, well, separate them between bankers and industrialists or this um, common group of banker industrialists, it seems that they 
are all part of family conglomerates um, and these commercial houses were the ones leading the, the development of, of Antioquia and how different groups formed as bankers or, or, or industrialists. So if you could expand a bit more on, on, on that or perhaps if the central role was still for the commercial houses. Also, um, another question I, I had was in terms of the, and you mentioned a bit of this in the, in, in the paper, but putting Antioquia and the development of, the, of this region's financial sector within the broader national financial industry. Um, because you said there, there is in fact the shock at the end of the 19th century due to regulation and that affected the, how banks uh, appeared. But perhaps if you could expand more on how the development of, of the country affected the, the appearance or liquidation, the end of, of the life of some of these banks, or if it was the region affecting the overall country's financial sector development. Great. So if you want me to um, react now, um, the first thing that I need to say is that both are great questions. So um, the issue regarding causation in networks is it's a massive issue, right? So compared with other empirical settings, I think we're decades behind, uh, I guess, the credibility revolution. And the main reason is, as you described, everything is interconnected, right? So Everything is correlated, which is the, the main source of uh, usually of endogeneity. So in this paper, I'm pretty loose uh, in, in, that, uh, in that aim, um, but some of like my other papers are quite careful. Um, I think that the best approach to deal with that issue, again, considering the, the methods that we have available is uh, pragmatism right so I think that it's not um, and I think in a few years like people are going to see like just considering the rate of, uh, of development of this field are going to see this type of work as very primitive although it's a fairly a different year I, I would say but so for instance something that I do um, in my paper on industrial entrepreneurs is uh, using this exogenous variation that comes from um, the unexpected that uh, of people, right? So when you're thinking about global connectivity, that's fairly um, a fairly good, good strategy because the debt of someone in the network can basically change the entire wiring of the network, right? And if that happens unexpectedly, that's an exogenous shock to the network, right? You're not expecting that happening. And, um, and therefore you can uh, frame this in, in, in a causal perspective. But even in that context, there are many things that you could say because if you don't have a second by second um, observation of the network, then um, you're not exactly seeing an unexpected reaction, right? Like uh, you would have a few days or uh, months to adapt and, and that's a problem, right? So even in that type of settings, I'm fairly cautious describing what uh, I can say does cause it, right? In this paper, I'm a bit more loose, again, considering the type of aim of it, which is more descriptive. Um, I think that the field is more promising to evolve in a good direction following that approach and building on, on what probably are uh, reckless uh, um, claims. Uh, but it's already interesting to see this descriptive uh, uh, facts, right? Um, so what I really want, to be honest, is that like the field just criticizes what uh, I've been doing, and, and in that way we convene to something closer to 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 truth, which probably is the scientific um, expectations of all of all us. Regarding your second question, um, um, what I have to do is that in this period you do have a fairly fragmented uh, financial system. Things start to change. It's true a bit with, um, with uh, the Civil War of the late 19th century, but more than anything with the reforms of the camera mission, and this, is, this happens in the, in the early 20s of the, of the 20th century, right? Uh, before that, you could easily argue that Antioquia had its own 
banking and financial system quite connected to the mining um, region and the impact of Fed and the exposure to what happened was happening in other regions was um, to the best of my knowledge fairly fairly small right again this happens this changes very rapidly with the camera emission by the 1930s you only have a handful of banks that are operated in Antioquia and you have a pre an important presence of banks from well, from Bogota uh, mostly um uh but before that it's 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 fairly small the, the impact i would say okay thank you very much we have a question from paula vedoeli so, paula hi javier thank you so much for a great paper and presentation so i was wondering um if you could um derive any kind of inference or hypothesis about the direction of the investment giving these uh, clusters and connections for example i'm thinking whether um some clusters privileged uh certain industrial sectors or if uh certain super communities or clusters privilege more conservative or riskier investments so whether the configuration can explain a little bit about the investment decisions, right? So, because this could help us understand the emergence of more entrepreneurial behavior on the part of uh, individuals within these communities, right? And the second thing is that I was really struck by, and, and this is this is basic life, right? Uh, if you get associated with a politician, so probably your portfolio. Performance will reduce because, as you said, there are, there are the vagaries of the political cycle. But at the same time, there are things that perhaps um, these measures are not capturing, which are some positive externalities like access to credit or access to concessions or, you know, perhaps perhaps um, the goodwill of a mayor or um, 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 par parliament member. So. I was wondering if you could comment a little bit more on how politics can uh, color a, bit, a little bit your story. Great, thank you. So let me start with that uh, last question because I'm uh, quite uh, fascinated by that. And a good part of my agenda tries to deal with that in the sense of describing how social interactions are not uh, trivial, like productive factors, right? There's this classical idea that there's something like social capital and the more you have of that, the better. But the point is that social interactions constrain your behavior in many different ways and different connections are good in different contexts, right? So the profits of uh, social interactions are highly context dependent. And I think there's increasing evidence in other settings, for instance, uh, in political science, there's some research on, on that. So I think that what you point out is like totally correct. So it depends exactly on why what is your objective? Because even the existence of these connections, despite this negative impact in the banking profits, is paradoxical from a theoretical perspective. Like, why, why the hell did you have then these politicians as friends? And the most likely answer to that is that they were a beneficial in other levels, right? So maybe they were good in other businesses, or they were good at in the banking business in a different dimension, right? Uh, and I think we know very, very little about that. I think that sociology is decades ahead of us in understanding how social interactions, and I mean by that non-market interactions, um, uh, benefit different dimensions of our lives and constrain many other dimensions. And uh, pretty much what motivates a good part of uh, what I do in my research agenda is that, like trying to understand exactly those mechanisms. Um, so regarding your first um, your first question, which um, which I just forgot what it was, and so if you remind me very rapidly, that's that's absolutely fine. So it's about the direction of investment in industrial enterprises, right. whether right, these right, connections right. help us interpret <laughs> explain more riskier behavior, entrepreneurial behavior. So I, I guess there might be something about access to information, uh, access to external networks, like external to the Antiochian community. So I can tell you like a very specific result of, of my paper on industrial entrepreneurship, which is that the general result is that what really matter for you at an individual level to end up being one of these 
industrial entrepreneurs to be involved in this risky activity of creating a manufacturing firm, which was a weird thing in this, in this rural environment, was to be global, well globally connected, right? So again, to connect different pieces of the society, right? That, that's the best predictor that you were gonna be on an industrial entrepreneur. And uh, the question then is why, right? And uh, one of the mechanisms that I identify is that it's not related to, for instance, innovation. So it's not a story that you connect different people and therefore you come up with better ideas, which is something that it's frequently uh, part of the, the story in, uh, in the economics of innovation and, 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 uh, and creativity. Uh, but so, and how do I know this? Because I know the type of activities of this firm. So I know, for instance, the number of patents that they had, right? And I re recognize that within those that ended up being entrepreneurs, if they were better globally connected, they were not creating companies that had more innovation, that were closer to the frontier, to the technological frontier. But what they were creating were firms that were more resilient, were firms that supported better crisis. So what it seems to be and the like rationale of, of uh, that the paper finds is that you were embedded in an environment where markets were quite poorly, right? And being an entrepreneur requires to solve a bunch of problems, right? You need to get the machines from Europe. You need to get someone that repairs the machine when it arrives. You need to train the workers. Those things are different type of, apply different type of resources and you cannot have access to them in the marketplace because this is an environment where markets are incomplete. So what you need to do is to um, is to know the right people and doing that implies to be well globally connected because those resources are spread in, in society, right? Uh, so it's a story more about resilience than for instance, about innovation and creativity. Uh, that doesn't answer the entire question about the like investment preferences, but I think it's already a signal of what was useful in, 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 in social terms in order to be what type of business person. Okay, thank you. So we also want to, to invite you to register to our coming event that will be taking place on February 14th the next year. Um, we'll be hosting Alberto Fenstra and you you can find the, the links to the WordPress site where you can register in the in the chat, also where you can subscribe to our uh, YouTube channel where you'll find this and other recordings. Uh, so we um, will close with one last question by Ignacio Gonzalez here in the, in the chat. It says, very interesting research and amazing work with the data. What happened with the entrepreneurial activity among bankers, industrials, after they amalgamated. It would be very interesting to know if these merged elites improved or not the entrepreneurial activity. So that's a good question. Um, I unfortunately do not uh, have any uh, research in the following period, um, but I can tell you something about the like business juncture of, of Colombia nowadays. And a good part of what is happening nowadays is that we have this large conglomerate is uh, called uh, El Gea, El Grupo Empresarial Antioqueño, which in a certain way comes from this period, right? And what you had is this cluster of, that is, has two, three pillars. One is a food company, the other one is an insurance company, and the other one is a construction company. Um, and again, the origins of this come from, from, from this period. And what you have is this, a uh, very uh, cohesive and well-protected conglomerate uh, that is supported in this long-term uh, social interactions. And now just recently, that the stability of that conglomerate has been uh, threatened by uh, uh, an attempt of acquisition by uh, uh, some foreign elites, if you want. So this is one of this person is an a banker from, from Bogota, you could argue, and an investment fund of Abu Dhabi, by the way. Um, and many people are quite surprised. Like we're basically breaking this, um, uh, this equilibrium that has existed for, for decades. So what I can tell you then is that um, the, this arrangement of uh, interconnected ties that uh, go from like family, uh, connections to business activities 
has been pretty successful and stable for uh, for decades, if not centuries, and uh, and that's interesting, but and important, and probably very salient. But that doesn't mean that it's not eventually a, a, a fragile equilibrium, right? That now could be broken in what seems to be a fairly um, a small set of, uh, of of moves from foreign uh, uh, threats. Thank you very much, Javier, for your wonderful presentation, that magnificent uh, data set that you have built throughout this, this year. So we can see the, well, at least the beginning of the, of the results of what would be a very interesting research agenda to follow. And thank you to all who attended the, the session. We wish you very happy holidays for those of you celebrating and we look forward to seeing you in the next um, event next year. Thank you very much and see you soon. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye-bye.